everyone and welcome to this episode of Justice in the Balance. I am James Milan and today I am joined uh, with, uh, excuse me, joined by uh, the Citizens for Juvenile Justice, uh, let's say leadership team or part of that team. Certainly uh, Leon Smith, the Executive Director, is here with us as is Sana Fadel who is the Deputy Director. Uh, I welcome you both um, thanks so much for taking time out of your days to join us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Um, we want to get into uh, as quickly as possible a uh, conversation about just what you, uh, <coughs> excuse me, CFJJ, uh, where, what it's all about. But before that, we can never uh, resist uh, at this time. Uh, just asking, checking in with you guys. How are you doing? Clearly, you're in your homes as am I. Um, how's it going for you? Leon, how about you? We'll start. <laughs> it's been, it's been very busy. Um, as we will talk about, um, COVID-19 has posed a lot of challenges, um, for us, um, as advocates in the field, as parents, and as you can imagine, it's both significant challenges for the children and the families that we advocate for. So um, engaging in the work, uh, making sure the state agencies are doing what they should do to meet the needs of these populations. Um, it's been pretty nonstop. Um, it's been very busy, but um, it's work that we're really pleased to do. <laughs> And that you're able to do, obviously, you know, at that nonstop pace, continue to do. Yeah. And how about you, Sana? How are how are things going in your? Well, it's. I've learned a lot about privilege during these. To um, being able to just do this work from home is a privilege in its own. Being able to be with my family, and not worry about my family. Well, I worry like the things I worry about my family are not ne anywhere near the things that we worry about for, for the young people we advocate for. Um, it is the challenge has been how do we do our traditional advocacy and our organizing in ways that have to be remote different ways of engaging people and understanding well what are the people needs of people because when you're not face to face you're not able to hear well this is when a government agency says this well this is how the impact is happening on us on the ground and um we've had to adapt in these eight eight or so ten weeks i'm not sure Time. Right. It's hard to it's hard to keep exact you know, track That's of how sure. to get that information and making sure that we are and that we are accountable. Like as advocates, we have to be accountable, um, so so that we are we, we are able to raise the voice of the people we advocate for. Um, so we've had to adapt. How do we do that? And a lot of it was our partnerships with parents and young people and and allies and provide. So it's you know we're physically a part it has brought a lot of us together in ways to say but we are we're trying to see one vision for young people in our state for all young people and um if i can take a quick or ask you guys to take a quick step back and just uh get a sense of what the history and the mission and the operation of citizens for juvenile justice is so um how long has the organ for instance let's start with how long has the organization um been in existence? Well, we just celebrated our 25th year last year. We were very proud of that. Um, we're the only independent nonprofit statewide organization um, that works exclusively to improve the juvenile justice as well as other youth serving systems in Massachusetts. We do that work um, on, a, on a systemic level. So we don't have individual clients, um, but we look to hold systems accountable through four primary pillars of our work. Advocacy, coalition building, which center referenced um, and reaching out and connecting with um, grassroots and community-based organizations, research, and then public education, which has been a really big part of our work since the beginning of the pandemic in ensuring that communities and young people are informed of what state governments are doing relative to this pandemic. So, um, as you just said, you you guys don't 
either represent or work with any individual specifically, rather you are uh, operating on a systemic or uh, a policy level, basically ensuring um, that the systems are operating the way they're supposed to or improve um, from Absolutely. what. Mm -hmm. So, and that entails both working directly with um, state agencies and state agency heads, but also the legislative work that Senna leads on our behalf. We were actively involved in the Criminal Justice Reform Act of 2018, for example. You look at some of the key provisions there, raising the lower age of juvenile court jurisdiction, expanded opportunities of diversion for young people. Those were part of the campaign of the Juvenile Justice Coalition, which CFJJ convenes. Um, so, in no particular, I, I'm going to let you guys kind of handle the, the narrative flow of, uh, of the interview, because what I'm interested in, what we are interested in, I should say, uh, is the fact that, of, of course, while this series in general tends to focus on issues and um, in, um, policies and programs that apply uh, to people involved in the justice, in the justice system, um, I understand that the folks that you are advocating on behalf of and working on behalf of, um, they have a whole life and a, a, an intersection with the uh, justice system for these juveniles is just part of that long, uh, well, not so long, but part of that life that they are living and is connected to the other parts. So in whatever order you would like and however you wanna handle it, just take us through uh, the arc of, you know, a typical uh, client that you would be, again, not, not working with personally, but that you have in mind or that you work on behalf of. Well, look at it in this way. We have a target population um, of young people from birth through their mid-20s. So if you look at, you hear terms like, you know, school to prison pipeline or the trauma to prison pipeline and the child welfare system, you see young people begin to encounter systems, um, you know, four years old, young people, uh, you know, children in preschool who are being suspended from school or a five-year-old who goes into the child welfare system and is moved around. Things happen that exacerbate trauma that these young people have been through and that can drive them throughout these youth serving systems and later into the criminal justice system. So we look at that broad range of not only young people who are currently in the juvenile justice system, but that arc that leads young people into it, as well as, you know, young people into their early 20s where science tells us their brains are still developing and they still need to have um, a therapeutic and a rehabilitative approach. Um, so, and we really want to boil down what we do is these young people in Massachusetts, juvenile justice system, child welfare systems, they are coming to the table having experienced trauma and they have a sort of mental, emotional, physical health concerns. During a pandemic like this, which yes, it impacts us all, for these young people who already have these mental health challenges, these emotional health challenges, they're only exacerbated by all the stressors um, that are going on during this difficult time. Um, the rates of mental health needs for young people in the system are incredibly high. So, you know, for all of us to step outside of ourselves and you take a teenager who's had a life of trauma, now they're in a situation where they're incarcerated and separated from their family and they're worried or concerned. Or if they're fortunate enough to be released, they're returning to communities of color that are disproportionately impacted by COVID. And they have family members that they worry about and there's family stressors. So, you know, looking at the stress and anxiety and all of these other factors that are challenges for young people, we try to advocate to make sure the young people get the help that they need, when they need it, and the state systems are accountable for doing that. And how, how hard is it, how hard is it to do that? Uh, what are the, you know, what are, what are the particular challenges that you guys are facing, um, you know, day to day, week to week, month to month? I'll let Senna jump in. Are you talking about COVID related? Is, is it a um, no, actually, and thank you for clarifying that because yeah. I do want to say that um, uh, as Leon, as you 
aptly pointed out, it has been a common theme in many conversations we've had in this series and others over the last number of weeks, that this situation that we are in now has exacerbated existing inequities of all sorts. Um, and certainly um, areas in which our society is falling short under normal circumstances and, and populations that are underserved under normal circumstances, it's even worse. But I do want, I am asking about kind of the, in general, the work that, that you do on, again, normal circumstances. Nonetheless, uh, Leon has just laid out a number of the, of the uh, either institutions, government agencies, et cetera, that you have to work with or hold accountable or both. Uh, I'm just wondering whether that piece or other pieces are particularly challenging and if you can just give us a sense of yeah, just what you're what you're up against in a, in a sense in terms of trying to do the work that you do. So one example, you know, we have a legis we have legislative campaigns each legislative session. Um, you know, one of our key initiatives that Senate can elaborate more on is seeking to raise the age of juvenile court jurisdiction to bring 18, 19, and 20 year olds into the juvenile justice system. I was a I was fortunate enough to be a member of a task force which looked at these issues and. What we've learned is when you look at the entirety of the adult criminal justice system, the worst outcomes, the highest levels of recidivism are for these emerging adults because they are, these are, are young people, 18 and 19 year olds who are still in high school in some cases that are put into an adult correctional system that is punishment based rather than being in a rehabilitative system. Um, so you speak of challenges, the challenges to push a system that is used to things being a certain way, to embrace the new science, to embrace all these new studies, and to pivot and to do something different when what we've been doing clearly isn't working. Then you have COVID-19 happen, and you have all these closures in the midst of a legislative session, which only makes that push that much more challenging. So that's an example of how, um, like the legend of Sisyphus, we're pushing the boulder up the hill anyway, and then the boulder gets bigger, you know, in a time of COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sana, did you want to? And, and I think, like I mentioned earlier, another challenge is we, we see what's good. Uh, our, our advocacy is based on what we understand as what are the best science, what are best practices, so things that are like, like that we can study, but also we cannot, it has to be grounded and so we talk to young people and they say well the biggest issue right now is around the digital divide or how we're going to be how discipline is going to be look, look different for us in schools well when i have a conversation with the state on how they're going to expand education they're not talking at the level of well what are individual schools going to be how are they going to be disciplining kids and they're going to work we're going to be pushing out young people out of education so push out um is the idea is you have all of these state this, our society builds state agencies or systems that has a goal, a societal goal. For children, that societal goal is how can we support them so that they can transition positively into a healthy adulthood. That is, transition statement towards children, that is it. Transitioning young people into a healthy adulthood. So whenever any part of that system that says, you don't belong here. You are somewhat, you are an other. You don't deserve, you are not deserving. You are somehow we want, you don't belong. We want to punish you. You're not eligible. We are pushing child serving that helps young people. And the system that always accepts people are, 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 are like our correctional systems, right? So wherever, at every point, if at every point in our child serving system, we're told no, 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 no. Oh, that's where we have that push out into the, into the adult criminal justice system. So we have to be ground. This, thing, this, this legislation or this policy change, it sounds good. First thing, our, our one, the first thing we look at is if it is a race neutral policy, it is probably going to exacerbate our racial disparities. In Massachusetts, we have we may be progressive and blue, but we have some of the worst racial, racial disparities, decision points in our systems um, in, in the country. Uh, not everything, but in some of, when we have racial disparities, we are in the bottom of the, of the, of the country. 
but we hide that because we are a progressive state and because it's a smaller number, so you don't really see it. Um, that's, so that's the first thing you see is, is this racially, is what you're proposing racially equitable? Yeah, if I can, uh, sorry, sorry to interject, but I just want to, um, to, to kind of elaborate a little bit or dig a little bit deeper on what you just said, because yeah. uh, I think it's a really important point. I know that this is one of the crux points in arguments around affirmative action programs, et cetera. What, you, what you're saying is if the legislation, if it looks race neutral or fair to you know, everybody regardless, regardless of race, ethnicity, et cetera, it's actually going to operate to the disadvantage of disadvantaged populations. I think that's what you're saying, yes? I'm gonna give you two examples to put this into context. So one example is pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. One of the lowest incarceration rates in the country, including juvenile incarceration. However, so, one, so for the past two decades, we've been doing a lot of reforms in our juvenile system to reduce the number of people, young people who are in locked facilities. Young people's behavior has not changed since I was a kid, since my kids are kids. Kids are our response has changed. So in the last two decades, when our juvenile system has moved towards a, what's called a positive youth development, this whole idea of young people developing into a healthy adulthood, we have seen that the number of young people have de into the juvenile justice system has decreased significantly. Um, so um, it, it was uh, what we, the number of legal system involved was it was in the 1990s. However, if you break that numbers down, th those numbers down by race and ethnicity, what you will gonna see is the biggest drop has actually, the benefit has mostly been to white, white young people the number of black and latino young people has also decreased during that period of time however at a much lower rate a fewer number of young people who are detained or locked up they are much they're at the the rate they're higher rate of black and latino kids and in massachusetts that that the data point is actually worse for latino kids um with covid and i think th this may have been addressed in one of your previous um uh, episode the like show was something like the the um, I think it's called the critical care the, the the decision that DPH came up with that says you know if Massachusetts reaches a point where we have all these people we have more people who need ventilators or life saving care that it, then we have a hospital capacity we are going to be race neutral we're going to be socioeconomic neutral we're going to be all these things there are certain things we're going to likelihood of survival. Well, when you, that sounds, if I'm not a doctor, sounds medically fine, doesn't sound malicious in any way. And I think the statement that says we're not going to take someone's status into consideration is like, oh, we're not going to harm people because they're, they're not seen as a value, they're not seen as valuable to the society. But the flip side of it is, well, when you have health disparities, where you have uh, lower access to, to preventative health care, higher rates of poor health poor healthcare because of the, the structural racism. Well, you say, well, you know, we have more, we're seeing across the country, more black people are dying from, uh, disproportionately dying, being impacted and dying and hospitalized. Um, and there's nothing we cannot, that's an example of, well, you know, the state has reversed course based on activism by what people who are saying, like, if you are doing race neutral, you are going to not only say, well, it's not, the problem with race, racism, first racism is to say, well, it's not my fault, this came before me. But I say, well, you're not acknowledging that at, when a decision comes to you, yes, you cannot change or have a responsibility to say, I cannot continue to exacerbate those racial disparities. So we're kind of hopeful to see how that plays out in the COVID conversation statewide around the, those public health considerations. Yes, let, let me ask you, um, about that basic situation you've just laid out. Um, are the government agencies, the legislators, et cetera, the, the, the folks that you are working in conjunction with or negotiating with or however you want to, to describe it, um, do they understand what it is that you are, have just described? Do they understand that something that looks race neutral on its face is going to because of the natural operation of our societies? and the inherent privileges in these one, you know, individual situations as they'll play out, uh, the inherent privileges that white people in, enjoy in all of those situations means 
that something that starts off race neutral or is uh, in, 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 on the text, on, on its face race neutral, is not going to operate that way. Do they understand that? Um, mm -hmm. And or is it that um, you have to convince them of that as well? Well, I'll say this. Um, this is one of the biggest struggles that we have because Massachusetts is really a textbook example of why it's so important to publicly available data at every juvenile or criminal justice decision point that is disaggregated by race and ethnicity in real time um, or as fresh a data as possible because it would, it would illustrate these disparities where they are and give us the ability to then be able to work on them. It's also why it's so damaging that conversely, we are one of the least transparent states in the country when it comes to having publicly available data disaggregated by our race. Going back to 2007, CFJJ has been pushing for greater data transparency in these justice systems, and it has been a continuous struggle. And I think it's because it goes beyond the surface of that common narrative, which locally and across the country, which is that Massachusetts does great at criminal justice because their system is so much smaller. Um, I always use the analogy that Massachusetts is like a shiny apple that looks really perfect on the outside, but you bite in and then there's a rot, there's rot underneath the surface and that rot are the worst racial and ethnic disparities. So in many ways, we have a sterling reputation when it comes to juvenile and criminal justice, um, but it hides these disparities and, and the push pull that we constantly go through is saying, look, it's not about making anyone quote unquote look bad. We need to see, we know these disparities are there. We need to see them, we need to see at what decision points, are they at which kids get arraigned? Are they just in commitment? So that we can then you know, shine the light, shine that spotlight on and work on them. And so what I would suggest is that there is an awareness um, that these disparities exist um, and people don't want those disparities elevated into the light because instead of looking at them being brought into the light as a benefit in that we can work on them to make them better, there's an idea that, oh, does it make this decision maker look bad or that decision maker look bad or this person look like they're racist? Um, when in reality, it's really all about making a system that's more equitable for young people. Mm -hmm. And do you, could you possibly cite an uh, example, positive, negative, your choice um, of, you know, doing the work that you're doing and what that resulted in? Um, for instance, you were saying that you, you, you guys were a uh, significant voice in the formulation of aspects of the criminal justice reform uh, bill that passed a couple of years ago here in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Uh, perhaps something that you did uh, along those lines, or just, again, a couple, one or two concrete examples of, of the kinds of legislation or policy making and changing uh, that, you've, that you have been involved with. Well, I'll give one example and then I'll pass to Senna. One is in Massachusetts, we now have a juvenile justice policy and data board, um, which is housed in the office of the child advocate which is trying to get at some of these issues, meaning requiring there to be data sharing between all of these youth justice state agencies. This is, this is something that we were pushing before that, asking you know, state agencies to voluntarily come to the table and share information and share data, but now that's statutorily required. And we do sit on not just the data subcommittee, but also there's a community-based intervention subcommittee that's looking at how to make diversion equitable and not have justice by geography. So that's an example of we're not transparent, we don't have state agencies talking to each other, when in reality, um, a kid who's a DCF kid is also a kid that's in the juvenile court and is also ending up in DYS. So sharing that data would allow us so much more information to say, wow, this is the number of crossover kids we have and these kids have these unique needs. So now let's plan how to best serve these kids best on the, based on the data. Having the, the JJPAD, at least puts us on the road to hopefully getting that kind of shared data to raise the level of advocacy for young people. So that's one example that I would give. 
Okay, and just for clarification purpose, before we move to Sana, um, what is JJPAD? Juvenile Justice Policy and Data Board. So um, it's statutorily created the Office of the Child Advocate in Massachusetts. Okay, that's what you're referring to. Um, and so they have, a, they have both the board and then they have one subcommittee on data, one subcommittee on community-based interventions that benefit young people, and then they have a, a subcommittee that's based on um, trauma and the best way to provide services to trauma impact the young people. So it's structured in such a way to, we talk about that sort of cradle to prison pipeline, it's structured in such a way to get at all these issues that impact young people throughout that arc. Okay, and Sana? So part of your question got cut off, so let me rephrase it to make sure I'm answering the right question. Um, so your question is what we have accomplished to address some of these or looking at the things that we're looking to accomplish? Um, well, an example per perhaps of something that you have feel like you have accomplished and then happy also to hear about things that are on, on the agenda and that you're aiming at. Okay, and we haven't touched any of the COVID stuff, right? So it's all like background. Okay, um, so, um, like Leon mentioned, the 2018 criminal justice law, there's a few things in there that passed that we are very, very parents. We sort of like it, the work that we do isn't just, you know, for these young people that we advocate for. We actually advocating for our own kids as well. Um, and we see all these, you know, these kids are just as our own. Um, so um, two that I like to share with my, my friends who don't understand the legal system is one is we raise is the age of juvenile court from age of seven until the age of 12. So a second grader before the July of 2018 could have been arrested. And we did have a number of young people, a, a, a little over a hundred and a little over a hundred young people under the age of 12, which is sort of like our, our middle school cutoff, who were in, had open juvenile court cases at that point. People disproportionately kids of color, disproportionately were kids arrested in school, and disproportionately kids who are involved in the child welfare system. So sort of like that, that's what, sort of our impression. So that's one of the things we were able, to, we were happy to do. Another one is, you know, as a parent, if your own child gets in trouble, who would be the first person you want them to talk to? Right, your the parent. Right. In Massachusetts, we did not have that confidentiality. It was something we had to fight for for a long time. But if my child tells me something, when I know something that my child did, I need to be on my child's side no matter what. This is why we have an attorney-client privilege, because a client cannot navigate the legal system. There's no other person that I can think of that needs another person as a child needs their parent to navigate something that has such a huge impact on their life and just the, the, the risk of loss of their liberty, that they could be incarcerated and not having a, a be, being able to talk freely to, to a parent, that was something that um, that was 18. Um, and it was not an easy fight. We actually had to fight for this and it was pretty very visible fight on in the front pages on the Boston Globe on, the, on those issues. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we were able to do, which had a significant num impact on a number of young people entering the juvenile justice system, is the, is the issue of school-based arrest. JJ partnered with the Massachusetts and the National ACLU um, and we looked at why are kids being arrested out of school. When we first started that they were like no no don't look there's nothing to see here we are only arresting these bad kids they're only arresting them because they bring drugs into school they bring weapons they're doing violent you know violent behavior uh, 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 use arrest as a tool for kids who are not we don't think deem necessary. So we looked at the police, we actually got the police reports and analyzed those reports. And we found that the vast majority of kids being arrested were for nonviolent, non-drug, non-weapon, verbal misconduct. They were being disrespectful, being loud. But that was, that was their crime. But the other thing we found was we know kids, again, equally do this all over the state, but you are, if you are a child of color, um, Latino, or if you are a child with mental, with, with a 
you had a higher risk of being arrested. If you're a child of color with special needs, your, the increase was like much more higher. So you have, um, so we saw a lot of kids with autism or other kind of, or, ha, or ha, uh, were on a special education plan that their behavior was tied directly um, or that disability or, um, but the response of the school was, let's get a police officer to remove that child from the school because that's how we can do it. So we fought that, we fought to tie those nonviolent, all only verbal. The first three months after the passage of the law, we percent drop of young people being referred to school. So it wasn't just a school-based arrest, but it, it, it trickled on across the board on all these non, like nonviolent, low-level offenses for young people, where a state was like, well, we have, we, we need to find a res different response to that behavior rather than arrest and prosecution. And, um, and like trying to keep more the records of young people more confidential, that came in the 2018 law, but we're still working on it. Leon talked about the, our uh, plans, our, our hopes to get young, older teenagers, so the 18, 19, and 20 year olds, out of adult criminal justice and into more into the rehabilitative criminal justice system, similar to other cities that serve that age group under the transition, transition age youth component. So they're considered under the child and adolescent unit of an agency rather than the adult agency. We're hoping that the legal system also follows suit. And actually, that, that, that's an example that the stark difference that the adult corrections versus the juvenile system is responding to polar opposite. And this highlights the, why we need, we need to be pushing, continue pushing for these reforms. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let us, let us uh, indeed now move on to the specific impacts uh, that you guys are, are seeing as well as dealing with uh, both yourselves and your work, and more importantly, in, in a lot of ways, the populations that you represent. Um, uh, what are the impacts of COVID um, on, this, on this work or in this area? So one area that I think is affecting children across the Commonwealth, but is particularly acute for young people in the juvenile justice system is related to education. So all of us who are parents, as we all know full well, um, that there's a disruption in the middle of the school year. Um, schools are now closed and there has been a rocky transition from your, your child, your students sitting in school in class to now being at your dining room table or a desk in their room in front of a laptop. So, you know, it's been a disruption for all kids, but I know I stand in a position of privilege knowing that um, I have internet, I have the technology available. My son goes to a school where he was able to get on Google Classroom right away. Um, we still have a situation now where 40% of kids in the juvenile justice system don't have that access right now as we speak. Um, and there's so many levels and layers to it. So, you, you know, you're a high school sophomore and junior, um, and you're in a juvenile justice system, you've made a misstep, but you're still trying to get your grades up because you aspire to go to college. And now because of COVID, you're facing a situation where you're looking at a pass or a fail. Well, it's great you don't fail the year, but what does that do for your game sorts of aspirations? Um, a major issue, and this is again, it's an issue for all young people, but when you consider the fact that nearly 60% of committed youth in DYS have an, an individualized education plan or an IEP, it's particularly acute relates to special education. So you have students who, again, these are students with emotional disabilities, learning disabilities. School has been a struggle since they were very young. And because of that, they need that specialized instruction. They need that help from a paraprofessional um, in the classroom. They need those related services like counseling when they get frustrated. In a, in a classroom, they have that. But now that they're removed from that, even if they're fortunate enough to have internet access and they're fortunate enough to have um, some sort of Schoology or Google Classroom or some sort of online um, access, 
access is not the same thing as having the related services and specialized instruction that you need to access that curriculum. Um, and so we're seeing across the Commonwealth, you know, young people, you have a sign in to, you know, Google Classroom and you have the ability to reach out to a teacher if you need help. But we know these are students who need much more hands on help. So again, it's impacting students in communities, but given just the high um, overlap of students with IEPs in the juvenile justice system, it's having an even greater impact on young people there. When you look at, you know, at least DYS is making moves consistently to get students the access they need. For young adults who are in the adult correctional system, be they the county houses of corrections or, or um, DOC, the Department of Corrections, some of those young people are getting nothing at all. You know, when COVID started, um, a very punitive approach took place. There were lockdowns. And so these are young people who the education system has failed them. They're just trying to get a GED. They're just trying to get to the end. And now they're getting no instruction whatsoever. So we know that when we, when we talk about factors, um, that reduce recidivism, that lead to better outcomes. None is more important than education, and yet these young people who are system involved, um, that, that core thing, we always say education is, matters, education is the future. Well, education is in chaos for these young people right now. Um, yes, and, and Sana, are you, did you have anything to elaborate on what Leon was saying, or in addition to? Again, talking about the specific impacts now um, that you're noting um, of, of COVID on, on your populations. So Leon was going to talk about education. I was going to talk about child welfare. So that's right, and he did. Yeah, we lost you for a little bit. I know, there, my computer just said uh, that. Leon. <laughs> so I talked about yeah. education and special education and the impact on uh, sort of DYS with their high special ed population and then the adult some of the kids in the adult system, yes, they're over 18 and 19 and 20, but they're still kids, um, not having education. So um, I was thinking maybe you could talk a little bit about the impact on the child welfare kids who flow in. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, Thank you both for your patience with, with the technology. This, this new world that we're in, right? <laughs> um, so another risk factor of young people entering our juvenile justice system is child welfare involvement. That was another um, research project we had done, we anecdotally for years, everybody knew like, you know, if you're in the child welfare system, uh, you have a higher. So what we tried to look into is what, so most young people who are in the child welfare system do not enter our child well, uh, our juvenile justice system. However, most young people in the juvenile justice system have, have, have a current or past history of child welfare involvement. So we try to figure out what, what is that overlap? What makes someone, what's, what increases in the child welfare system of entering the juvenile justice system? Um, so we have a report called Missed Opportunity and Shutting Down the Trauma to Prison Pipeline. They're all at our website. Um, excellent reports, if I say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they were really eye-opening in terms of like, what are the risk factors. So what we know is, um, 5,000 young people uh, in Massachusetts have had an open child welfare case, but only 20% of them are actually enter our foster care system. So that's something that most people don't understand, that most families are not in the, most kids are not in the foster care system. However, if you are one of those one in five kids who enters the foster care system, your likelihood of entering the justice, the, the juvenile justice system um, by, uh, some national studies, it's about, um, it increases likelihood by three times, um, of just, just the removal from home. Another risk factor is the fact that you bounce in placement. So just because you're removed, there are still things, you could, because some kids need to be, um, but not, not every child's experience in foster care is similar. Some, ki some kids go, are removed for a little bit, the parents get whatever support they need, then the, kids, the child gets returned, it's a small time frame. Other times it's a longer involvement and the child is placed with a family member, an extended 
so it, it gives the family a little bit more flexibility and time so that they can deal with whatever, whatever issues they have, especially if it's issues that are uh, things like substance abuse and mental, uh, or mental health issues that need longer period of time to re recovery where a child can still be stable with, with kin. And then there's flows who cannot be placed, that have been placed long, for a long period of time, and or another where we start seeing the risk factors. Kids who get placed bouncing from foster home to foster home, that's one of the hugest risk factors um, we saw in Massachusetts as well as nationally, and we can and it's supported by clinic by clinical ob observation where kids are bounced from place to place. So every every adult they've encountered tells them, "Well, you don't belong here. This is there's something is wrong with me, or something is wrong with every adult around my life my, around me, and I don't trust them, and I hate everybody around me." So they they that they either internalize, they say something's wrong with me, or they externalize where the behavior comes out. Is more aggressive, then they're being then that's being la that's labeled that well you're an aggressive child, you're assaultive, then that becomes well we can't arrest you. And that's the system. Another path is that kids who bounce tend to be placed that they may end up in more non-community based and in residential and group homes. And those are that was another area where we saw a significant increase a uh, jump in number of kids being arrested. Um, and entering the juvenile justice system are those who have been previously placed or like they're um, so knowing that pre-COVID that that was those are the risk factors we are doing our advocacy right now to say well how can we um, know, knowing that those are risk factors how can we make sure that our COVID advocacy addresses some of those concerns so we want to look are, are some of those things actually being exacerbated by policies that have been developed because of COVID? So some, so for example, um, like I told you, one of the risk factors is, you know, if, if someone, if a family does need some kind of support, well, what kind of support can you have? Can you get support in the community so that the, the family is intact and you get supported? Or can you, um, does the child need first things that was approved in the state was removal of children. So we can remove children out of their homes as an emergency. Being able to get the family support was much later to, to, to sort of, it's coming in later. Um, the fact that, you know, can, if the kids were on the path to reunification, that has not, those kids are not considered an emergency. Um, being able to get supports for, uh, in, in, in the court cases to get like a social worker to help a family meet some of those conditions so once the courts are open they're like the family's in a better place those have been slow to happen and have not been approved as an emergency um, family visitation has been very very slow for a young person to can be is to stay connected to their family in best of circumstances when you're in a situation a public health crisis with a lot of a misinformation you don't know what's right and what's wrong there's a lot of anxiety your, a lot of the, your, your connection, social connections, your, your educational connections are not there. You need, so, it, so, other, so if a child is in foster care and has a plan to reconnect with their family, their ability to be connected to their parents and their siblings, if the siblings are in foster care, is key before COVID. And now that COVID says it means like, well, you need someone who's gonna be with you, stable no matter what. Those have been very, very slow. Um, and the guidance, the kind of the guidance is coming out that is not, it's not prioritizing that those, those family connections happen. They are working, and we recognize that some of those need to happen, and we need to like the staff who are considered essential workers of state agencies that are doing this work need to be also protected. But we we want to make sure that when our advocacy is that those are bring back online and not something that we can wait on when things are when settled down um, mm -hmm. so we're also looking at you know young people who are in group homes group homes because they are small facilities with um, a lot of young people who cannot do social distancing how can we are there ways to say well if you're in it and more in a more community based are in, 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 um, accelerate those are there ways to make sure that young that families that are about to be reunified we can get those services earlier on and work more intensely with families rather than at a, at a, at a the traditional timeline 
Um, I uh, think that, you know, certainly I and I think by proxy my our audience um, have gotten a really comprehensive um, view of uh, the, just the complication and the overlapping uh, issues and stressors um, on the on these young people who you're advocating for, but also on the work that you're doing, how many different levers need to be pulled, etc. Um, the question that just keeps coming up for me, and, and also I have to tell you for, for Sarah, my co-producer, is what can we do? Uh, is, it a, is it a matter of increasing awareness? Uh, do we need to um, be putting more pressure on our lawmaker? T tell us what should people who are listening to this, galvanized by what you're saying, what should we be doing? Sorry, I cut you off because my, <laughs> my mic said we were not done. Um, so there's a few things that we're working on and we would love your audience's support on. So one is um, in terms of in the child welfare, we're working on how can we provide um, services, particularly one of our areas of focus is on young people who are aging out of foster care. And, that, and again, that is one of the risk factors of legal system involvement. You age out without a permanent family, then you're more likely to end up homeless without education and with and higher likelihood of Massachusetts to follow other states in the country and some national advocacy to do a moratorium on young people aging out. So if you are able to get services as um, someone who has, is about to turn 18 or has turned 18 and is about to turn 21, and you can get voluntary services from the Department of Children, education, employment, and housing, and housing is really, really key during COVID. We want to have that moratorium in Massachusetts so that just because you turned 18 or you turned 21 during COVID doesn't mean you are on your own. We want to make sure that we have, we have a, a delay in that aging out. A second piece is ha this emergency housing for young people, and that is a resources allocation. Um, what we know is young people who, who are vulnerable who move out, like if you're in a foster home and you engage in behavior that is COVID risky because you went out to hang out with your friends and did not do social distancing, and you live with a foster family and has underlying health conditions, where does a young person go? Um, if a foster family doesn't feel they're safe and they need to be quarantined or, and, and that we're seeing like, uh, I know Bridge Over Troubled Waters in Boston is, is fielding a lot of these calls. Like I'm, in, I'm 17 and I have no place to live. I aged out and I have no place to live. Where can they live? And this is a, a resource for funding specifically to house young people who are child, who are legal suspects in, in our from um, from our child welfare system to be able to access you know, some kind of housing so that they're not homeless during COVID. We're also looking at young uh, the um, I know there's legislation right now to look at decarceration or reducing the number of adults. Mm -hmm. So no, in the juvenile system, we didn't get a chance to talk about this. DYS has been doing what advocates across the country have been asking their juvenile systems to do on their own um, with, with, with allies, but without having to do a lot of pressure, trying to keep, how do you, how do you keep young people in the community more, um, still under, with, with you're looking at the adult system to do similar. How can, can we do, reduce the number of individuals who can be, in, uh, who are incarcerated and have them in community-based supervision? We have the legal capacity to do that. But we need leg legislative action to say, yes, this is something we do during COVID. Um, we don't want to have our, uh, our correctional facilities be petri dishes because that in spots in Massachusetts in correctional facilities, you have staff going in and out and that's what, how, how it comes in. But then once it goes out and it spreads in, the, in our communities. So it's in our public health and our public safety benefit to find alternative ways to hold people accountable and do it safely without having to rely on our, our model of putting people in cities where I'm going to quote Bristol County has a has a correction the sheriff there. Um, don't don't no I'm just kidding. <laughs> six, six feet apart is practically impossible in any correctional setting. 
in any jail, in any prison, in any state, in any county, anywhere. And that was in response to an SJC lawsuit, and that was his formal response. And just yeah, to, I'm sure you have something to add. Well, and just to piggyback, um, just taking the statements that Senna just made and paying them forward, um, I would encourage people to support our campaign to raise the age of juvenile court jurisdiction because um, these emerging adults, these 18, 19, and 20 year olds, we know they're at, they're at a distinct stage where they have great potential for rehabilitation and they need developmentally appropriate programming that they are not going to get in the adult system. And as a general rule, we know that them being in adult systems outside of COVID, um, they have the highest recidivism rate, they are getting collateral consequences by picking up a quarry that is gonna negatively impact their future moving forward. But then you add COVID on, you know, within these adult facilities, there's a perception out there that because young people have a lower morbidity rate that they're less at risk. Um, and unfortunately that has messed with the correctional mindset. Um, so that these young people are more at risk, you know, while they are inside these facilities, they have limited family engagement. So arguably um, the most vulnerable um, people, these young people in the adult system who have these high rates of trauma and, and, and mental and emotional health issues have this limited family engagement, which is leading to even higher levels of trauma. And, you know, when you look at what the juvenile system is doing, when you look at how DYS, without the pressure of, of being named in a lawsuit, is moving to decarcerate, while at the same time, these county houses of correction are fighting against it tooth and nail, it's just a reminder that raise the age is good, sound policy, under normal circumstances, but with these young people being at risk, having in some cases no access to education, being put in situations that compromise their health, it's more urgent and more relevant than ever. You know, I think it probably goes without saying um, at this point for anybody who's been uh, listening to our conversation uh, that you guys are, uh, you know, committed, deeply committed to this cause, and there is so much work to do. I want to acknowledge that as I also have to say, we need to, to uh, draw a conclusion uh, to this conversation, even though um, I, I can readily admit that there's so much more uh, that we could be covering. So we'll have to save that uh, for a future conversation. I know you guys are gonna be continuing to uh, plow away um, uh, nobly at what you are doing and I hope that we can get back together again uh, sometime in the not too distant future and celebrate perhaps some more accomplishments um, on behalf of these uh, vulnerable youth populations that you guys are advocating and working for. Um, we want to thank you both um, for joining us today of course and also for the work that you're doing. Again, um, Lots and lots of us care about what happens here. Relatively few of us are working uh, to make those things happen. Um, so yeah. our appreciation to you very much. Um, Leon Smith, the executive director, and Sana Fadel, the deputy director of Citizens for Juvenile Justice, joining us today here on Justice in the Balance. Thank you again, guys. Um, we'll talk to you again soon. I'm Thank James Berlin. So Thank, Thank you for joining us.